And welcome back inside the home office. I'm Craig D'Amico, and this is a brand new edition of NEC Women's Basketball on the Run. Well, we've passed the halfway point of conference play. We're now into February, and we are full speed ahead on the road to the 2023 NEC Women's Basketball Championship. Coming up on today's show, we will look ahead to this week's marquee matchup on CBS Sports Network. We'll pick out the top stars from this past week, and we'll have an incredible conversation with Fairleigh Dickinson Jr. forward Chloe Wilson. You're not going to want to miss that. All that coming up, but first, let's catch you up to speed on this week's top headlines in our three-point shot. We started last week with one lone remaining team unbeaten atop the conference standings, and that was the Wagner Seahawks. They played their lone game of this past week on Thursday in Brooklyn, against the St. Francis Brooklyn Terriers. Wagner jumped on top early with some hot shooting to take the lead at halftime by six. But Terriers head coach Linda Simino would later say that no one would believe they'd only be down six at half with Sarah Bandoma and Tyra Myers both out for most of the first 20 minutes in foul trouble. But they were only down two possessions and they came back out and played a third quarter to remember, outscoring the Seahawks 25 to 12 back at full strength. Now, it would go back and forth between these two teams in the fourth quarter, but it would come down to Myers, making a clutch basket for St. Francis Brooklyn with about a minute 19 to go. And then the Terriers, who are statistically ninth in the league out of nine teams in free throw percentage on this day, they would make six of their final eight from the stripe in the fourth quarter to close out the game. Wagner, though, would have one last chance. Marissa Sanchez-Henry gets a good look at a three that would have won it, but it's no good. And the Terriers knock off the Seahawks from the ranks of the unbeatens, 61-59. to Coach Sims saying later on that this was the best team win for the Terriers since they upset Michigan State at home a season ago. So the Terriers coming off perhaps their biggest win in over a year. They would have to turn it back around in about 48 hours on Saturday and play a road game just down the street against their rivals, the LIU Sharks, in the 30th annual Battle of Brooklyn. Myself and Pam Roker had the call on ESPN3, SNY, and NEC Front Row. And to be honest, it was a game that the Terriers never really were in. LIU jumped on them 17-9 in the first quarter. The Terriers, incredibly, then held LIU scoreless for the first seven minutes and 30 seconds of the second quarter, going on an 8-0 run to tie the game at 17. But then, after not scoring for the first 7.30, in the last 2.30 before halftime, LIU exploded. Ashley Austin connected on a three to end the drought. Claire Henson, Dia Dennis, they both added key buckets. And perhaps the coup de grace on top of everything was this play from half court. Ashley Austin launches it, draws the foul, and connects perhaps the shot of the year in the NEC. She would then make the bonus free throw, a four-point play, and LIU, despite not scoring for the first seven minutes and 30 seconds of the quarter, actually won the quarter. They outscored St. Francis Brooklyn 12-10 to 10 overall when all was said and done in quarter two. Now, the Terriers did get to within three in the second half, but that was as close as they would get. LIU would pull away, and for the first time since 2016, LIU would win the Battle of Brooklyn 69-54 to over their borough rivals. The Battle of Brooklyn plaque will reside at Ashland and DeKalb for the next year. St. Francis, Brooklyn, they just had a poor shooting day, only 29% from the field, their leading scorer, Alyssa Fisher, finished with two points on one for 13 shooting. While on the other side, Austin finished with 25 points, four for 10 from behind the arc, three rebounds, and six assists. She was named the 2023 Battle of Brooklyn Most Valuable Player. The Sharks pick up their first NEC win of the season and their first Battle of Brooklyn victory in seven years. So here's how we stand as we cross into the second half of conference play. No more unbeaten teams at the top of the standings. So the 2013 Quinnipiac Bobcats can have their annual toast. This on their 10-year anniversary, they remain the last NEC team to perfectly run the table. Wagner with their setback against St. Francis Brooklyn falls to 6-1. and one, A half game behind FDU and Sacred Heart 
who are both seven and one atop the league. The Terriers, they won one and they lost one as we highlighted this past week. They are in fourth place at five and three, two games ahead of Merrimack and SFU, who are both three and five. That is your battle for the top four seed. Remember, the top four clinch first round home games in the NEC tournament. The Terriers have only hosted two NEC tournament games in their history, and they lost them both. But this time, it wouldn't be at Remsen Street. It would be at their new home at the Pratt Institute, where they're quite comfortable. They're 5-0. and oh. They've never lost at their new home. The Terriers, on the flip side, are 0-12 oh on the road. So home court for St. Francis, Brooklyn, a top four spot in the standings, could come in handy about a month from now in the NEC tournament. Stonehill and Central Connecticut are both two and six, while LIU secured their first NEC win of the season in the Battle of Brooklyn, their first win overall since mid-November. Time now for the Heat Check, featuring the top three stars from week five. Our third star this week is Nysera Pryor from Sacred Heart. You know, we're, we're starting to kind of run out of things to say about Nysera Pryor. She's been a mainstay on our list each and every week, and she's back once again following a weekend of averaging 16 and a half points, five and a half rebounds, six and a half assists, and two and a half steals in a pair of victories against LIU and Stonehill. In the fourth quarter against the Skyhawks, with the game still hanging in the balance, Pryor scored the last nine points for the Pioneers, including a steal and a score with about a minute 20 to go to double the Pioneers' edge from two to four. She made all the late free throws to preserve the win and a spot once again in our heat check top three. Our second star is Chloe Wilson from Fairleigh Dickinson. Wilson helped FDU bounce back from their first NEC defeat of the season with a pair of strong performances this past weekend. She was limited to just 19 minutes with foul trouble against SFU, but came back to score 15 points in that game. Then just two days later, she collected 18 points and eight rebounds against the Warriors. Wilson is the league's third leading scorer here in 2023. And our top star of the week is Ashley Austin from LIU. She came to the Sharks by way of Cal State Bakersfield and Texas Southern. And now in her first year with the Sharks, she has become a go-to scorer for Coach Rene Haynes. This past weekend, Austin was added to the starting lineup and she made the most of that opportunity. She scored 23 points against Sacred Heart before making history on Saturday afternoon, setting a new career high with 25 points. She then made the play of the weekend, maybe the play of the year so far in the Northeast Conference with a half-court buzzer-beating four-point play, and she joined the likes of Kim McMillan, Tamika Dudley, Val Nyema, and Ashley Palmer to win the Battle of Brooklyn MVP trophy in an LIU uniform, and she's the very first to win the MVP award in an LIU Sharks uniform. After averaging 24 points, four rebounds, and four and a half assists in two games this past week, Ashley Austin is our top star of week five. It's time for the NEC Open Mic, and our guest this week is from the reigning and defending <clears throat> NEC regular season champion, the FDU Knights. She's currently third in the league in scoring, seventh in rebounding, FDU junior forward Chloe Wilson. Chloe, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so great to have you here. You and the Knights are off to a great start this year, seven and one, as we hit the halfway point already in this 16 game conference schedule. So, what's been the secret to your success so far here in 2023? Honestly, the same thing that it's been for the past few years is just teamwork and working together and just being focused and prepared for every game. Now, you know, basketball is kind of a simple game when you think about it. If you don't let the other team score, there's no possible chance of them winning. So your team kind of embodies that because you don't allow the other teams to score that much. Your defensive play has kind of been off the charts. So what have been some of the messages that your coaches have been giving you guys about taking care of business on the defensive end? Well, one of the biggest things that Coach Ange and all of our assistant coaches um, try to emphasize is that defense wins games. Like our offense um, – comes off of our defense like FDU is mainly known for defense and the more we play defense the better it is for us and the better defense that we play the better it is for us so just always uh, making sure that we focus mostly in practice on defense and trying to you know stop the other team from scoring the basketball now we've seen you on the court you have, you have the ability to kind of take over games on the boards and scoring but, but what's the balance for you to kind of you know stay tough stay aggressive but also trying to stay out of foul trouble what's the balance for you in that 
still trying to bounce it out. I'm not going to lie, but um, I've just been like trying to learn from every game that I've um, been playing this past season and seeing how other teams are playing me. And also my teammates play a big role in it because if it's not for them and me kicking out the ball and them, you know, attacking and stuff, it, it, would, it wouldn't open up our um, offense and stuff. So I really want to give thanks to my teammates for also being a threat on, on offense and just being there for me too so that we could just all play the game together. Now, we mentioned at the top, you guys won the regular season championship last year, fell in the semifinals in the tournament, but got to experience the WNIT against Seton Hall. So for you and your teammates who are coming back from last year, uh, what was that experience like and how maybe can that help you going forward now into February and March this year? Well, yeah. Okay. So yeah, obviously falling in the um, semifinals isn't something that any team wants, especially as a number one team, but um going into the WNIT, I do feel like it helped us with our confidence and, you know, playing against Seton Hall, you know, just allowed us and showed us that we're, we can play with anyone and everyone. So um, I also do think that this year too, um, the team and as well as Coach Ange, we like to feed off of last year and how we felt last year and bring that into our game, implement that into our defense and our offense and like everything that we talk about um, this year, because we know we don't want to feel the same thing that we felt last year. So basically just using last year as a fuel for our fire. Now, let, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Uh, how was it? When was it that you fell in love with the game of basketball as a kid? OK, so, yeah, um, to be honest, I started out as a track runner. I was a runner at first, never really looked at the game of basketball until the age of like 14, like, wow. you know, 13, 14. So I really didn't start to like eighth grade. And then I got this really cool AAU coach who turned into my high school coach who then allowed me to come here to FDU or helped me get here to FDU. So um, I think at first I was really just playing the game as like just a rebounder and a facilitator and just, you know, doing a little dirty work. And then as I like progressed into me playing the game, I saw that I could also be an offensive threat. And, you know, I could do everything that I like to do it on the court. And I just fell in love with the game throughout me just playing throughout the years, to be honest. And what was it in particular that you liked about FDU that led to you joining the Knights? I just from the jump, um, the players who were already here are current players. When I came to visit, they were um, off rip nice. They were like just welcoming Coach Ange is a really cool coach. Like the staff that was here before was really cool. Um, cool. The staff that's here is really um, awesome. So I feel like just that warm, welcoming feeling and showing that I'm um, that I'm wanted here and that I'm like I'm well like it's. It's a welcoming school and a welcoming um, program. And and coming up uh, this weekend, a big game. It's kind of the collision course that we've been waiting for all season. The, the preseason favorites, FDU and Wagner. So as you guys have been practicing all week long, uh, well, what are some of the keys and the points of emphasis that you guys have been focusing on getting ready for the Seahawks? Mm. That I can't tell you fully because oh. I don't the Seahawks are watching. <laughs> But, you know, just like I said before, like our biggest thing is defense, like our defense determines on how the game is going to go. So we've just been making sure that we've been watching films on the last few games and trying to correct on the defensive stuff that we can correct on. And we've also been um, starting to watch film on Wagner and just knowing how we're going to play on certain players and just do certain things. So the biggest thing that um, I can tell you about FDU and us is defense, like defense, defense, defense. And I think that's why we're, we're so excited about this game. I, it is, it's definitely going to be a great match if everyone's going to want to tune in Saturday at 2 p.m. on the CBS Sports Network. And Chloe, I have a final five questions here, some quick hitters to give us the first thing that comes to mind, all right? Okay. <laughs> all, right, all, right. all right. Favorite snack or junk food? Uh, Pop-Tarts right now? Pop-Tarts. That Strawberry. works. Okay. Yeah. Of course. Of course. Uh, what, what is a pregame superstition of yours? Oh my gosh, my team knows this. Got to make a pregame TikTok. Got to take my pregame shower. Two things. Okay, okay. Uh, if we took a survey of your teammates, what's one trait or adjective that they would use to describe you? <laughs> crazy. <laughs> <I'm> crazy. <laughs> okay. Crazy. Energetic. Energetic is a good one too. Okay. Uh, Kansas City Chiefs or Philadelphia Eagles? I don't watch football. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we can go with the Eagles then. Is that Philly? That is. Oh, yeah, yeah. My roommate's Philly, so she's there from Philly. Yeah, there we it. go. Okay. And last question, what's the key for FDU uh, to get to the championship and win it this season when all is said and done? Defense. <laughs> no, nah, but defense and also just 
playing together as a team. Like one thing I could tell you about this team is that I really feel as though these girls on, on this team are my sisters. And like, we went together, we lose together. We're just together from the minute the ball touches um, from the start all the way to the end. So just being together as a team, playing our FDU um, night defense, and also just moving the ball and sharing the ball on offense too, because we're also a really good offensive team. So it's really just staying together and following our, uh, our program. Well, we, we look forward to following the journey all the way, uh, hopefully through March. We'll see. But uh, Chloe, thank you so much for joining us. An absolute blast talking with you. And uh, we'll see you coming up Saturday against Wagner. Yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's Chloe Wilson. And this has been NEC Open Mic. This week's Stat Chat is focused on the upcoming battle between the Wagner Seahawks and the Fairleigh Dickinson Knights. Since the start of the 2021 campaign, that's all of 2021, all of 2022, and the partial returns back from 2023, these two programs are the two winningest programs in the Northeast Conference. FDU leads the league with 34 wins since the start of the 2021 season. Wagner right behind them in second with 28. That's just ahead of Mount St. Mary's with 25, SFU with 23, St. Francis Brooklyn with 22, and Sacred Heart with 21. Both programs, FDU and Wagner, have been building something special over the last few seasons, a journey that they each hope leads to them cutting down the nets about five weeks from now. For these two programs who both have championship aspirations, it would be their first time in forever winning the Northeast Conference Championship. Wagner hasn't done so since 1989, FDU since 1992, and a lot has changed since those time periods. Gas prices in 1989 hit a dollar, if you can believe it, and in 1992, they hit a buck 13. The number one song in March 89 was Lost on Your Eyes by Debbie Gibson. The number one song in March 92, To Be With You by Mr. Big. And the number one movie in March 89 was Lean on Me, while the number one flick in March 92 was Wayne's World. A lot has certainly changed since each team last hoisted the trophy, but Wagner and FDU hope this year's NEC tournament leads to them partying on into the NCAA tournament. We start the second half of conference play and the first weekend of February with a Thursday-Saturday schedule this week. Here's what we have coming up on tap. On Thursday, the LIU Sharks finish up their three-game homestand at Ashland and DeKalb, playing host to the Merrimack Warriors, winners of four out of their last six. The Sharks trying to turn their first NEC win into their first winning streak. Stonehill will take on SFU. The Red Flash escaped with a four-point win in their first meeting back at the beginning of January. And St. Francis Brooklyn will look to bounce back from their Battle of Brooklyn showing when they take on Central Connecticut State. But our feature game on Thursday is the Wagner Seahawks and the Sacred Heart Pioneers. So Wagner suffered their first NEC loss back on Thursday, but they were off on Saturday, meaning they had to sit around all week and sit on that loss before finally having a chance to get back at it. And waiting for them in this game just so happens to be a Sacred Heart team that also has a one in the loss column. Both teams tied for first place, and we'll see two teams who are in the top three in conference play in both scoring offense and scoring defense. Plus, if you like guard play, this will be the game for you. Two of the top guards in our league, Nysera Pryor for Sacred Heart and Z Thibel for Wagner, will be center stage. And then on Saturday, the road doesn't get any easier for the Wagner Seahawks as they will be involved in our game of the week, 2 p.m. On the CBS Sports Network, myself and Takira Carter will be on the call for the Wagner Seahawks hosting the Fairleigh Dickinson Knights. The long-awaited first meeting of the season between these two heavyweights will go down Saturday on the CBS Sports Network. Now, suppose Wagner wins on Thursday night against Sacred Heart. They'll then have to turn around in less than 48 hours, and their reward will be to try to beat another one-loss conference team in FDU. But suppose they don't win that game against the Pioneers on Thursday. Then all of a sudden, the story and the situation changes quite a bit because they'll be going into this game against the Knights, taking on the reigning regular season champions, trying to avoid dropping three in a row, which would drop them from the top to the middle of the NEC standings. Wagner and FDU, they are the two runners up from last season. They're the two preseason favorites this year, and they're the two teams who have the most conference wins since the start of the 2021 
campaign. It's a big game in the standings, as we've mentioned. The first of two meetings this year, they split their two meetings last year, each winning on their own home court. The Fairleigh Dickinson Knights post the sixth best scoring defense in the country, only allowing 52.6 points per game. They're even better, allowing only 47 points per game in conference play. And good luck if you need a three-pointer against them because FDU is the number one three-point field goal percentage defensive team in the country, allowing opponents to convert at just 22% from the perimeter. There are Bigfoot sightings more frequently than FDU allows points. But as we've mentioned, Wagner does sport the top scoring offense in the NEC, 69.7 points per game in conference play. They're also a top three scoring defensive team in the league as well. And Wagner also forces 21 turnovers per game, a top 15 mark in the country. So ball control, defense, rebounding, limiting second chance points, all appear to be keys to victory in this key conference clash. Plus, as a bonus, you'll get to see Chloe Wilson and Kem Wabadu battle in the post, a matchup between two ladies who have proven this year that they can dominate and take over games. It should be a fun matchup to watch. Now, FDU this year, they would love to get a second straight regular season title when all is said and done. Wagner would like to win their first regular season crown since 1989. And both teams know the path towards those goals will be right through one another. And it all starts on Saturday. The 82nd all-time meeting between Fairleigh Dickinson and Wagner, two of the top teams in the league, Saturday, 2 p.m. on the CBS Sports Network. Well, that'll just about do it for this week's show. We can't wait to talk to you next on Saturday afternoon, 2 p.m. atop Grimes Hill in Staten Island, the Spiro Sports Center for the Wagner Seahawks and the FD Unites. And, of course, we'll be right back here to wrap that game up and everything going on in the Northeast Conference from this past weekend on next week's show. Until then, I'm Craig D'Amico, and this has been NEC Women's Basketball on the Run. 